and we are have, have started to change the way we create content and the, the, the right format for the content because things that work in the past for Google search are not working for Gemini or work differently for Gemini or ChatGPT or other um, 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 chatbots. So we need to adjust uh, our the type of content and the structure of the content in order to meet the new algorithm. Can you think of any specific examples? Are you talking about FAQ, short form versus long form snippets? Like what, what, is there a specific thing you're doing differently for AI? Yeah, we found out, for instance, that those tools really love uh, like a structure uh, formats, uh, like tables. Uh, you don't have to show the, you know, the, the borders of the tables, but once the, 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 the output, the content is, is built in the, in the format of the table, it's easier for those tools to uh, um, capture the, the data. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples, not just trending ideas or buzzword-laden schmaltz, real-world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. Wherever you are in your career today, you're not necessarily stuck there. I've heard time and again from guests on How I Made It in Marketing about how they've been able to make dramatic, perhaps unlikely career shifts. On the flip side, if you're a hiring manager, do not pigeonhole potential recruits based on only their current experience. For as my next guest puts it, look past the CV. We'll hear the story behind how he learned that lesson in his career, along with many more lesson-filled stories from Tomer Zucker, VP of Marketing at DID. Thanks for joining us, Tomer. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Daniel. Nice to meet you. And nice to be here. Well, let me tell the audience a little bit about your background real quick so they understand who they're listening to. Uh, Tomer spent 12 years at Microsoft. He held roles in sales and marketing and left as a channel executive for multinational accounts. He also worked at IBM where he again, he worked in marketing and he was a business unit manager of security software for the cognitive solutions division in IBM. He was the head of partner marketing for Amazon Web Services. And for the past year, he's been the VP of marketing for DID. DID has raised $47 million overall including $25 million in a Series B round of funding led by Macquarie Capital two years ago. And Tomer manages a team of 10 marketers in addition to freelancers and agencies. So Tomer, give us a sense, what is your day like as a brand strategist? Wow. Um, you know, working uh, for a startup in the hyperdynamic domain of generative AI, which is, I think, the front line of the industry. It's really crazy. Um, it's uh, um, a nice mixture between brand and performance, between marketing and product, and marketing and sales. So we, it's all around. Um, last year, we had um, a very interesting and strategic uh, process of rebranding, uh, reshaping the strategy of the company. I had the, the pleasure and the, you know, um, the opportunity to lead uh, this uh, process from a marketing perspective. And now, uh, since the beginning of 2024, it's the time of execution, executing all the brand strategies that we have designed back then in 2023. So um, it's super exciting um, from a marketing perspective uh, to deal with you know, the new branding, the new voice, the new narrative, and to do that in a fast-paced industry like uh, AI industry, which is crazy. All right, well, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot of lessons from that. Not to mention, as we mentioned, your entire career, sales, marketing, channel, yeah. all that stuff, right? It's going to be great. So um, let's take a look at some of the lessons from the things you made. That's a great thing we get to do as marketers get to make things, right? I've, I've said before, I've never been an actuary or a, a podiatrist, but I don't feel like they make things, right? We make things. Like you said, you make a brand, we make things. Uh, so your first lesson is look past the CV. So how did you learn that lesson, Tomer? Yeah. Um, so my, my story as a marketing, uh, didn't start with my, my marketing, um, uh, marketing was my passion, but I've started my journey in sales. Uh, and to be honest, after spending a few years, uh, with sales around 30% of my career, 35% as an, as a, as a, as a professional was in sales. And this is one of the first recommendation I share with students and, you know, junior marketeers, um, and even senior marketeers spend few years working with sales, at sales, you know, create these kind of frictions with real customers. Um, and I had the opportunity to do that. So I spent a few years working for uh, enterprise sales, 
uh, that time it was uh, at Microsoft. Uh, super uh, complex, you know, sales cycles, very, you know, um, demanding customers, you know, big enterprises, retailers, manufacturers, and uh, uh, financial in, um, um, services company and such. But my heart, my passion was in marketing. Um, but, you know, I don't know if you had the chance to work with big corporation, but uh, once you are like being tagged as a salesperson, it's really hard to switch from another uh, for other disciplines. And it, it's like, this is like the complexity of life. So I, 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 need, I, I needed to create like this kind of a bridge, I would say, be, be, be between sales and marketing and create my, my own opportunities and hopefully um, to get this kind of chance. And lucky for me, I did get a chance. One of the senior marketing manager, he managed a, um, a team at the marketing division, uh, probably um, saw something in me as a human being um, above the CV, uh, beyond, <laughs> beyond, beyond the, you know, the, um, the, the LinkedIn profile or, or my CV, and saw like a spark of um, marketing you know, uh, potential over there. And what I did uh, at that time is trying to get closer and closer from the sales discipline into the marketing. And I asked for a few opportunities to do like small projects, um, to run events, um, to create a plan. And once I established this kind of trust uh, from this marketing, uh, senior marketing manager um, at me, um, I've started to get mo more and more opportunities and waited for the right timing and the right timing reached to me. One of the people I helped them as a marketeer, it was on, by the way, on top of my day work as a salesperson. It was like the, my extra time, which I didn't have. Um, but that was my, my passion. In. So he, he uh, opened um, a new position in the company and he was approached to me and asked me uh, if this is something I would like to do. It was very, you know, uh, innocent question. And of course, I jumped into that. And I took it and uh, as much as I can and uh, invest all of myself into these uh, opportunities. Opportunity, sorry, and it, was, it went great, to be honest. I had to run like a mini campaign in order to sell myself because I was not the ideal, you know, candidate. I was lack uh, of like uh, ordinary or traditional marketing backup because I came from sales. And before of that, I did some techie roles. So I've started my journey in, in a techie role. I did QA, professional services. So my background was not like the ideal candidate. But again, this person saw something beyond my CV and gave me the chance, which I'm super thankful for that. Uh, and by the way, um, this is something I really uh, adopt um, as a manager um, along my career. And I have more than one, two, three um, you know, uh, cases when I open the door for people that are not coming from a pure marketing discipline and even um, not the exact expertise they have as marketeers, just to give people a chance if I see something that is lying there and it's beyond the CV. Um, for instance, uh, given an opportunity for a marketing manager that uh, run uh, a marketing for a, a ballet group, right? Dancing is far, far, far away from tech, right? Uh, or someone that was a digital marketing manager in the Ministry of uh, Finance uh, in the government, right? Different this sector, completely different sector. And I have more uh, than one example uh, like this. So I'm trying when I interview people just, you know, to dive into their personality, uh, their curiosity, their passions and their values, and to see if uh, I can, you know, close those gaps um and uh you know uh just make you know the things happen like like the opportunity i got so that's a really interesting background you you said you went to marketing uh you'd already had that sales background you even had that tech background doing things like qa so looking around you in the marketing department what did you do differently than other marketers with that background because earlier in my career, I had a chance to work with some major software companies. I was a consultant and I was working with sales enablement. And frankly, the head of sales was a little frustrated with the field marketing group because they didn't feel like they were getting enough leads from this major sports sponsorship they were doing. And so he introduced me to them and said, Hey, have this guy write it. And so I think that and it was successful. And I think the thing I did differently, and maybe I just got lucky, is the it, it was a, a sponsorship. And so they were very focused on the branding of it, right? 
And where mine, since I just, I've been working in sales in Aponlin, I've been working every day with sales folks and talking about their quota and talking about these meetings. It was definitely a little more rubber meets the road of not just this overall branding thing. It tied into the brand, but it tied directly into getting conversations with sales about specific products. And I think that was successful. Not unique to someone working in sales. That's, I think, partly the difference between brand marketers and direct response marketers. And as we mentioned, you're a brand marketer now. But what did you do differently when you were now in that marketing role that you've been in marketing roles since you've had that sales and tech experience and you've seen other marketers do? Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, in order to be a successful uh, salesperson, uh, I was okay. I was good, really good, to be honest. Uh, you had to have this kind of, I would say, like resilience because you have to suffer of getting a lot of no's, right? Um, it's, 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 it's build your character. And I think also like when you are spending time in the marketing, when you are running campaigns and events and trade shows and you're doing so many activities, uh, it can be very intense. It can be very frustrating when you are creating the best campaign ever, but it doesn't deliver. Um, you need to keep pushing. You need to uh, create this kind of character when you have to, you know, uh, just swallow and um, keep going. Um, I give you an, like, a specific example. Uh, one of the company I work with, uh, I came to um, manage. Uh, um, I, I can name the name, right? That that fine that's with me. Right. It's fine with you. Yeah, I know. Okay. So when I've joined the IBM um, as a marketing manager, the first role I did was the marketing manager of the system and the technology division, which is all the hardcore old school IBM technology, you know, you can imagine like hardware and network and storage and such. And what I found out that there was a lacking of real case studies, refresh case study that customer talking about the real benefit, the real challenges and such. And I work with a team uh, of uh, like 15 marketeers, something like that. And when I've started to ask some tough questions, why we don't have it, the answer I got, and you're getting that you know, the corporates from time to time, hey, we tried that, it failed, we cannot create, you know, case studies, you know. And, you know, as a salesperson, ex-salesperson, when someone say to me, saying to me, no, you cannot do that, or we don't do that here, it's give me like a, a zest of motivation, I would say. Uh, by the end of the year, I had 10 case studies um, that served the sellers, you know, across the board. And, and for me, it was like... Uh, like um, very, I would say, um, important win uh, internally to convince people that uh, you can bring uh, like new uh, tactics or new approach or fresh, uh, you know, perspective in order to uh, gain your your objectives. So you can imagine that after this kind of uh, ex- experience I had the last, the next time people say to me, no, we don't do that. I had uh, some uh, backup uh, to convince them that I can do something else. Yeah, We'll see about that. We'll see if we don't do that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So your next lesson you say, just pretty straightforward, delegate. So I assume this is the lesson uh, you learned as you've moved up in your career. How did you learn to delegate? Yeah. So, uh, you know, this kind of transition from uh, sales to, to marketing, uh, um, this is, as you mentioned, this is, was the right time for me to learn more uh, about delegation. Um, first of all, to acknowledge that my time uh, carries a uh, premium value. So, um, and, and it, to be honest, it, it's something that is hard. Um, it's not only moving from sales to marketing, it's moving from uh, individual contributor into management role. Um, my um, I would say my time has become um, a valuable uh, resource. I had to I had to understand that to acknowledge that uh, it was hard for me in the beginning uh, just to outsource some of the activities I'm doing for so so long, and I think I did that did them okay, and hand over in them to other people on my team or outsource to freelancers, um, but. The, the lesson I learned that in order to grow, you know, you need to relieve. You, you need to trust people. Uh, otherwise, you will be able, you know, you're going to stuck in the, in the, in the, same, in the same spot for, for years. Um, and it's like, it's like almost like a new skill I had to, uh, to, to teach myself uh, in order to grow. Um, and it's something that really helped me to uh, increase um, or to improve my impact. 
and increase um, um, even you know to uh, cross cross the road and get more and more responsibility uh, to my role um, so I had almost to uh, to understand that my time is precious and other people can do my role to Or my, my, my task um, as good as I'm myself um, once I train them or teach them and whatever and it worked and to be honest and I try to to, to um, you know um, teach this lesson to my my employees as well I mean can you give us a specific example of something you've delegated and how you did it because I think at a high level we all understand this I remember I was interviewing the the owner of a business of an, of an ad agency and we're having this conversation and the, 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 the way the light bulb went off for him is he would look over all the financials for years. And so uh, once he got this business coach at, at one point and he said, uh, and the business coach asked him, it's like, hey, you've looked over these financials for years. Have you like, first of all, how good are you at math? And he's like, well, not really. I mean, I, my, my background's in creative and that's why I had an agency, ad agency. It's like, okay, so you're probably, first of all, not the best person to do this. Okay, you look over these financials for years. How many mistakes have you found? And he said, I, I have not found any mistakes. And so his business coach convinced him, it's like, this is something you just have to delegate and let someone else own. And yeah, maybe there's some long-term looking over of things and making sure it's working well, but not the day-to-day that, that he'd been doing and wasting his time doing that. So can you think of a specific example of, yeah, what you say, I agree with, I think we all agree with, you know, you, you raise in your career, you have to delegate. But it, that's the biggest change for me. It was difficult going from, I can be hands-on in marketing and craft this exactly how it needs to be crafted. versus okay now I've got to trust someone else not only to do this right but to do it right by the deadline you know so any uh-huh. specific examples come to mind yeah I, I think uh, it's easier for me and I assume that everyone is to delegate um, you know project or task that you know I really don't like to do them you know it's easy to delegate <laughs> those kind of stuff right, so yeah, I know yeah. that yeah so I I really don't like um, and I have no like any kind of adventure in uh, advantage sorry uh, in like uh, logistics and processes and bureaucracy I, I really hate it um, so it's easy for me to delegate the, 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 the harder part of my role to delegate is those activities that I really love to do and I think I and think I'm good at that I re- I'm really love to create content I'm a content creator I'm writing hundreds of posts I have a podcast I'm running community and Uh, I really love it um, but it's it's time consuming work you know if someone you know creating blog posts and articles and produce these podcasts right um, it's work so those are the, the the exact points that it's it's like fighting with myself with my passion with my heart um, to relieve something to go to, to let something go for someone else it's almost like I'm um, saying goodbye to peace of my heart you know yeah uh, Uh, so one of the, of the specific uh, cases I remember is uh, creating uh, some assets for the for, for the sellers for the product marketing team whatever and I started to write down you know one page and such and then uh, I, I, I find I found out that uh, you know someone else can do that like I do even better so I had to relieve this kind of uh, passion I have and outsource or hand over it to someone else. Um, and I'll tell you a secret they did great better than I uh, but it gave me the I would say that, that the, 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 the understanding the understanding that uh, this is something I can replicate and do more and more and more and of course with the time I had I could do and you know something else that I have more like a relative uh, like like advantage you know but Uh, dealing with strategy or dealing with the, the, the structure of our, or, or my organization or to uh, establish a better uh, network uh, internally in the organization. And I feel frankly, one of the reasons we don't delegate too, especially as we're growing in our career is we're more comfortable with those things because the new things you have to do in that role, like you said, strategy, budget, means all these things like they're newer and they're less comfortable and they're frankly a little scarier. You don't have the blueprint for it already, right? If you have a blog post, you've probably done a hundred, a thousand, you know, boom, I know how to do this. But, but let me ask you on the flip side, I agree with you about delegating, right? But is there something specific or things that you don't delegate? You're like, no, I cannot delegate this. And I'll give you an example. Um, we once published a video called Copywriting for Marketing Leaders, Why You Should Never Delegate the Marketing Message and How to Get It Right. And I didn't come up with that. Our CEO, Flint McLaughlin, came up with that. I love that. And to me, writing has always been 80% in content, all content, 80% having something good to say, having something worth saying. The other 20% is just you know, saying it well. 
And so that 80%, especially overall for the brand, the value proposition, those things, I mean, I think every marketing leader should be deeply involved in that. Then the execution of that, yes, that's, that's where you delegate. And I could be wrong about any of that. But for you, like, is there something you're like, okay, this is piece I cannot delegate. I need to be deeply involved in it and understand it before I delegate other pieces around it to my team. Definitely, yes. Um, I can think about uh, three, uh, uh, three domains or th- three topics when I uh, insist to be deeply involved in. First of all, is the strategy. Uh, I mentioned in the beginning of our discussion that uh, we had a very interesting and complex uh, rebranding process. Um, it took a year. Um, half of this time, six months, it was mainly discussions around the strategy. Which company are we? What is the DNA of the company? What is the ICP? What is the, you know, the, the, the core advantages or the, the, the core USP for us uh, versus the, the market and the, the competitors? Um, in those discussions, I was the sole marketeers in the room. There were the founders of the startup, the chief product officer, a um, few consultants, and that's it. I um, was the sole marketeer because it's super sensitive, um, it's super strategic, um, and I um, create this kind of bridge from the strategy uh, to, to the, the extended marketing team only once the strategy was established, not before of that. So strategy is number one. The second part, the second topic is numbers. Numbers. You know, in the end, my role as a marketing, this is my approach. We can, we can open up a discussion around that, is I need to contribute to the bottom line of the company. That's it. Okay? I'm not speaking in, the, in terms of leads or MQLs. I'm talking in meetings, opportunities, and actual budget. Uh, sorry, actual ARR, revenue. So anything that deals with the numbers um, is something that uh, I'm into that very deeply together with, with my demand gen team, but I'm into that very deeply. It's super important for me. In the end, this is the contribution, the real contribution of marketing to the organization. And this is related to my own perspective about marketing as a department in the organization. Marketing, for me, it's not a cost center, it's a profit center. And in order to uh, back it up, I need to be into the numbers and ensure that we are heading to the right direction. So this is number two, numbers. And number three is all other sensitive, you know, um, activities that we are having. For instance, uh, working with with, uh, venture capitals, VCs, and uh, investors. Highly, you know, sensitive in some cases, highly confidential and stuff and stuff. So these cases where it's like a mixture of business, but also with emotion, uh, emotion, I'm trying to be in, in the front line. Those are, those are some great examples, very specific. Um, so you mentioned work, working at some big companies and, uh, you know, there can be, there's a lot of upside to working with a big brand. There can be some challenges too. One of the challenges you mentioned, understand the rules of the game and set your own boundaries according to your values. So what do you mean by that? Yeah, so when you're working on the, you know, these big giants uh, organization, uh, we are talking about thousands of marketeers, between hundreds to thousands of marketeers, on top of that additional stakeholders, you know, from sales, product, operation and such. You need to know to how to navigate in this, uh, in this domain to, to better understand, you know, the politics, the unspoken rules, um, the, 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 the things that are hidden from our eyes. Uh, in, in some cases, it's, it's very confusing. It's very confusing to, to, to make the, the right decisions or to engage with the right people. Um, in, in, and you can find yourself uh, in, a, in a very complex or sensitive situation. So what I'm referring to is, is, is to find, and maybe it's, it will sound you know, um, uh, weird to, to, your, to your ears, but to, to understand who are you as a, as a person, first of all. What are your values? What you are willing to do, and what you are not willing to do, in order to meet uh, uh, your own objectives. Um, it can it can be very, uh, I would say, uh, tough in those uh, dynamics. Um, I can tell you that uh, more than one time, I 
make some decision that impact my career because I didn't want to cross boundaries. Um, it's hard for me to jump into, into a specific uh, examples at this stage, but it's something that is related to a gray area between reaching numbers and hitting the targets um, and my values. Uh, in those cases, I'm trying to really listen to myself, uh, to, to my core, uh, and, and make the right decisions. Um, and in some cases, all, it was also related to a very aggressive uh, behavior of other people. Uh, so I need to take a stance and put some lines over there. So these are the type of uh, um, you know, cases when I go back to the, to the whiteboard and try to, to figure out what I'm willing to do and what I will not do. Yeah, and so, I mean, what you're talking about, I assume we could call office politics. And it, it like, what has been the difference between working for some of the biggest brands in the world, mentioned IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, and working for startups? Because, and yeah, I've had a chance to work with both too. And what I hear, it's so funny, like if I talk to colleagues now that are some very big companies, <laughs> you know, that's their complaints. It's office politics, you can't get anything done. It takes forever to get things done. They don't notice me. I'm lost, but blah, 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 right? And then when I ter- talk to people at the small companies, the startups, it's like, ah, you know, we, people don't know our brand. We don't have the budget. We don't have the resources. I don't have the skills. I can't compete with the big companies with their technology, right? So it's always like, you know, the grass is always greener, right? But you've, you've done both. Uh, yeah. So what has been your experience? Like, what in, If you had to break it down, like the pros and cons of the big brands, the biggest uh-huh. organizations in the world, and the startups, what would you say? Yeah, first of all, you know, where, uh, where you see people, you see politics. So politics is everywhere. It's, it's us as people, you know, you, 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 can, you can decide that you are not playing this game, but there will be some impact, you know. So you have to play the game. You can, you can, you can create your own rules and your own boundaries, but not playing the game will damage you uh, and your career. I'm I'm super honest, super open. Um, However, there are some few differences between working for a, you know, big corporation and a small startup. First of all, you see the people Uh, at corporates. It's really easier for people to, uh, you know, to uh, um, uh, play the stick and hike, uh, you know, um, and not see you in the, in the office, I would say. Um, But in a small startup, those are the people you are, you, you are, you are sitting next to, uh, you are eating lunch with. Um, you, you cannot hide from those people. So the, the communication is more direct, is more open. Um, and this is, for me, this is like a good side, a good side because it's, it's really right to my, my character as, as a person, as a human being. Um, but it's tougher. You need to, uh, you know, tackle directly um, some of the issues, some of the problems. Where in corporation, um, because of the you know more complex structure, you have a lot of uh, layers and hidden agenda. Um, it's more complex. It's almost like uh, you know um, trying to co- control the puppets. I don't know. Um, so again, there are some good side, good 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 sides and bad sides for each of the the, the organizations uh, structures. Um, and I, to be honest, I'm really happy I did both because it really gave me a perspective. You cannot win them all. Um, there are some you know, advantages working for a big corporation. You have the budget, you have a lot of people, you can gain some, get, gain some expertise in specific domains. While in startup, in most of the cases, you have like budget constraints. Um, you are always in a hurry because you know, startup, innovative, you know, very dynamic and competitive landscape. But uh, to be honest, after spending around 20 years in corporation, I really enjoy my last years working back uh, with startups. Um, I, I, my recommendation for people, if you have the chance to work in both sides of the, of the spectrum, I would say do that. Uh, it will make you a better uh, professional. Well, I love how you say it's not the organization, it's people. <laughs> when there are people, there are politics. Um, and in the second half of the, the episode, we're going to talk about people you collaborate with and lessons you learned. But first, I should mention that the How I Made It in Marketing podcast is underwritten by MechLabs, the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. MechLabs AI now has 13 expert assistants to help you with your marketing, along with a guided headline writing path to write a powerful headline, all trained on a methodology built on the results from 10,000 marketing experiments. It's totally free to use for now. 
You don't even have to. Uh, so just go to mechlabsai.com and start using it. That's M-E-C-L-A-B-S-A-I.com to start getting artificial intelligence working for you. So here's your first lesson. As I mentioned, we're going to talk about some lessons you learn from people you collaborate with. Time is your most precious asset. You were kind of hinting at this when we talked about delegation. You said you learned yeah. this from Alon Raphael. How did you learn this yeah. from Alon? So, um, yeah, it's funny because this is this is like a lesson uh, that really uh, uh, something that, uh, you know, he said to me like many, many years ago, uh, 15 years ago, something like that. We are still in touch. Um, he, he became like a friend and we are doing doing like a mutual mentoring, I would say. Um, but uh, he, he, te he teach me um, th that the, the, important, the importance of dedicating my time to areas where I have the significant value. Um, and this is something, as I mentioned in the, the beginning of our conversation, it was really hard for me to understand in the beginning because I, you know, I pushed that back. Um, but this le le lesson is critical when working with the, with the team. Um, but it also, uh, you know, resonate, uh, in, in this area of generative AI, um, going back to what we are, we are doing today. And I feel that on a daily basis, going back to the things I mentioned in, you know, a few minutes ago about creating those posts and content and such. Now I can save a lot of time using Gen AI tools and they are really saving a lot of time. Um. I assume you will have this kind of gain some experience working with the ChatGPT or other tools. If you know how to work with them in a very uh, methodologic, me methodological way, sorry, um, you can spare, I believe, around 60, 70% of your time. So it's not only like saving your time or delegating to other people, you can delegate to tools. And now we have the, techn the technology that you can outsource your day-to-day -day work um, that you don't have a competitive edge uh, to add on top of that to AI tools uh, that are very intelligent, they are very efficient, they are very fast. And once you delegate those tasks to AI tools, you can focus more on task or project that you, as you as a human being have an edge. Uh, in, you can invest more in being creative, uh, using more of your imagination or using your soft skills uh, to collaborate with other people. In the beginning, it was hard because how AI tool can write better than me? But they can. Uh, you are in the end. Um, I see that, by the way, um, when we are doing, I'm talking about myself. You know, I said that I really don't love, uh, you know, those endless processes and such. Uh, we are not good in uh, repetitive work, us as human beings. We uh, tend to be tired, uh, doing mistakes, you know. Uh, you see that a lot. But once you outsource um, those repetitive uh, tasks into, uh, for, for machines, for AI, you can save a lot of time, precious time, and do other, other tasks that are more important from a strategy point of view. Let me ask you, that's a great point. Then how do you stay an indispensable asset to your company in an era of generative AI? So for example, I interviewed Christian Javago about this way before AI, like 10 or 15 years ago. And her answer was, you know, you got to keep learning about new technology, you got to measure your campaigns. But one of the really key things I liked was you have to focus on understanding the customer better than anyone else in the organization, right? And she would talk about regularly interviewing customers in person on the phone to really understand them, right? And that's how you became an indispensable asset even before AI. But now for now, you know, you talk about it's, it's such a quickly changing environment with gener generative AI. It can do more and more every day. How do you stay an indispensable asset to your company? Yeah, it's a good question. It, it, to be honest, maybe my answer will change a year from now uh, because it's really hard to, uh, you know, to uh, capture the market. It, uh, the, the growth is enormous. Um, but I found I can, I, can, I can talk about a few things. First of all is our ability to orchestrate more than one tool. So think about now as a marketing manager, I have a team of 10 marketeers, as you mentioned at the beginning, but on top of that, I have some virtual workers. They are AI agents and AI avatars. This is what, what DID does. Um, so when I'm looking about the organization structure of the, my marketing department, I have real human beings, but I have also some virtual 
marketeer is there. And my um, advantage as a human being, as a human, human manager, I would say, is first of all, is to motivate my human employees and encourage them to use more of the technology, like the avatar and the agents, the AI agents, in order to benefit more. So I'm leveraging my own uh, virtues and, and capabilities as a human being to generate this kind of motivation and passion and uh, to encourage, uh, to do experiments for him, in, to make mistakes. You know, I, I believe AI, you know, um, if they are doing mistakes, they say, sorry, apologize, whatever. No, I'm, I'm, I'm allocating a certain amount of my marketing budget for experiments. And if someone is failing, that's fine, you know? And this is like a human character. This is my own, you know, uh, virtues as a human being, because this is going back to my belief. I don't know what are the beliefs of JGPT, but I really know my belief, my own beliefs and my, my own values. So um, this is like the, the places where it's, it's, it's more than a tool, like a functional, you know, uh, uh, skill set or something like that. It's before of that. It's around it's big words about inspiration, okay, about motivation, about uh, empathy. Those are the places where AI, generative AI, cannot bring value or at least not as much human being can. No, that's great. And I love what you say about the failing and experiment. I mean, I've heard it said, if you're not failing sometimes, then you're failing because you're not pushing it hard enough, right? I mean, I'm sure each one of us could be successful 100% of the time if we just stayed in you know, what we're comfortable with. But to really push it, you've got to be failing sometimes because then you're really pushing the envelope. Definitely. And, uh, you know, uh, this is, this is when, when people talking about the, the imposter syndrome, um, I, I'm always saying, okay, that, that's good. It means that you, you are walking away from your comfort zone. You are trying new, new stuff. It, it's a good signal. That's okay. That's okay. Completely fine. I love that. So earlier you were talking about how important the numbers were to you, recurring revenue. Um, and you, you, here's one of your lessons you learned uh, from someone. Without clear and identifiable goals, you don't know if you are effective, improving, or contributing. Yeah. So it sounds like you learned that pretty early in your career. How'd you learn that? Yeah, it's really happened uh, in the beginning of my uh, own journey as a sales manager at Microsoft. Um, I, 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 you know, many years ago, but I really remember that. Uh, I was on my way to a meeting with a potential client, uh, a companion with, uh, by a senior manager uh, for one, one of our partners, technology partners. And we had, uh, you know, um, uh, we had a meeting. I, I spent, I think, in this role only a few months. And uh, after the meeting, uh, this person, uh, he was like senior than me um, and more experienced than me. And he asked me a very direct question that really confused me. He, he, he asked me, what are your goals? Um, and it, this might seem very, very basic question, uh, but for me, it was, first of all, very confusing and very significant. And, you know, I remember that uh, although many years uh, have passed away um, and I realized <laughs> once he asked me that I really don't know the answer because my manager at that time didn't, you know, um, gave me any, any clear goals or KPIs. Now, without goals and KPIs, you don't have a compass. It, it, you don't know if you are winning or losing, if you are gaining real uh, contribution to the organization or not. Um, so it struck me. And after I went back to the office, I went to my manager and asked him for a very specific direction. And this is something I'm trying to do all the time. Okay? Set clear KPIs and goals. They can be quantitative, like sales quota and such, but they can also be um, qualitative, um, can be even soft KPIs. That's fine. But just show the people the way. People would like to understand if they are gaining uh, a progress or not, if they are, they are heading to the right direction or not. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. It, it even, it, it's even unfair for your employees or for your colleagues if they don't know what is the road and what is the direction? So, you know, be a spotlight. 
Well, can you give us a specific example of a goal you either set for yourself or someone on your team and, and how you came up with that goal? Because at Marketing Sherpa, we did benchmark reports. And one thing we would ask is, you know, what, what goals marketers have. And I was looking at an old chart about email marketing and it struck me that the top choice, it was exactly, I think, 67% each or whatever. It was exactly tied. It was between delivering highly relevant content, getting additional traffic and increasing revenue. And I thought, that's a great example of how we as marketers get torn sometimes, right? Because you got to serve the customer. You got to get more brand interest at the top of the funnel. You got to get hard revenue, right? And so, well, then what becomes... Is, is everything a goal? Or, you know, do you have to prioritize goals, right? So can you give us an example, kind of walk us through in your mind, like how you set a specific goal for yourself or someone on your team? Yeah. So so I think, I think the easier... Uh, goals is those hard-coded goals, okay? You have uh, numbers to bring. You need to generate revenue for the company, going uh, up into the funnel, how many opportunities, how many meetings, how many MQLs, how many leads, and such. This, these are, you know, maybe tough to achieve, but easy to define. Uh, you can see them. You can track them. I think the more complex goals are the soft goals, okay? The, the goals that can show this kind of progress, um, we talked about content, okay? So I've started to measure the type of content uh, we are creating. Um, it's, th there is like indirect impact of those KPIs on the hard-coded KPIs, obviously, but I wanted to uh, measure the quality of the content, okay? Um, it's great that we're, we're creating content and now with the Gen AI, it's really easy to create content, right? Uh, but I want to create the best content there is. We need to measure that. So measuring the number of pieces of content we're creating is nice, but also about the consumption rate of those content and the ranking of this content and how this content really serve the strategy of the company. I can tell you now at the DID, we are, um, have started to focus on specific industries like telco, insurance, and such. So I've started to move away from like horizon, um, like generic uh, you know, type of assets into more um, specific or industry-oriented um, uh, content. This is a KPI. How many assets we are going to create for the insurance uh, industry or for the commerce industry and such. So this is one thing. The other thing is like completely soft goals. And this is the question I'm asking my team members from time to time. What have you learned this week? Okay. Um, and and this, is, this is part of my uh, uh, philosophy as a manager. I want to challenge my team teammates. I want to challenge my 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 workers to uh, encourage them to learn something new. Um, and this is this for me. This is one of the KPIs. So I'm trying to allocate budget for people to learn more, to develop more. And this is not uh, uh, less important than reaching to the next you know uh, milestone and achieving the next meeting with the with the prospect. So you mentioned something really enticing. I don't want to overlook. You mentioned you're measuring the quality of content. So I want to understand how you do that because especially in the age of AI, I mean, so that was hard before, right? Especially, you know, when marketers are challenged with, do I outsource this to like a content farm somewhere or do I get, you know, a really high dollar writer, or whatever to, to do this, right? With AI, it's become even harder. And for example, we have this AI guild with a group, you know, that we're working on artificial intelligence. And as I mentioned, we have MechLabs AI. And, uh, you know, one of these uh, marketers was showing me like, oh, look, oh, ChatGPT gave me these 10 headlines and blah, blah, blah. Why should I even mess with MechLabs AI? And, you know, I was like, okay, but then we start looking at the screen and here's the 10 headlines from ChatGPT and here's the 10 headlines from MechLabs AI. And ChatGPT is great. So this is just a specific example. I'm not trying to diss them. But I looked and it's like, okay, look at those headlines from ChatGPT. It, it goes like this. You get 10 headlines right away, but then you forget. You don't look like they're not very good, <laughs> you know, versus, okay, here are the, the headlines that are better. Yeah. And I think in the age of AI sometimes, and again, this isn't particularly new to AI. This happened with content outsourcing 15, 20 years ago. Um, in the age of AI, it seems like such a magic trick sometimes where it's like, oh my gosh, I put this information in and stuff comes out and we give this false trust to it. And I've done this. I've done this. I was yeah. writing, um, for example, a blog post um, about this very topic, about how we can't overly trust AI. I put in a transcript or a chat log from one of our AI guild meetings into it. I put it into the AI. I asked it to summarize and I published that. And I didn't even notice. Someone pointed out to me, wait a minute, we didn't talk about landing page optimization. We talked about whatever other topic, right? So in that age of AI, 
how are you measuring the quality of content? I feel like we're just kind of sometimes mesmerized by this magic trick that we overlook that but not all yeah. of it's high quality. I, I totally agree. I think it's uh, easier and easy, getting easier and easier to create content. You don't have to be like, a, you know, like the, the content, the, the ideal content creator in order to create content. And it's, it's very uh, temptating to create a lot of content. But most of the content created by AI is, 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 is mediocre. It's not the best. You need to work. You need to polish that. So I'm talking about like if they can help you, uh, those two, to cross like the 60, 70 percent, percent uh, of your journey. But then you need to add your own, comp- your your own voice, your own perspective. Um, and, and I have to be honest. I encourage my team members to use uh, ChatGPT and uh, Gemini and and Claude and such tools because I truly believe about their values. More than that, I'm hiring only people with X experience working with Gemini tools to my t- department. So it's a mandatory requirement from, uh, uh, for me as a VP of marketing to hire people um, that deal with Gemini. Now, yeah, Gemini brings more uh, complexities because once you, everyone creating more content, it, it's hard, it's getting harder to stand out because you have so many alternatives. And my focus on, is on the last mile, those 20%, to give specific examples. You know, adding the, the, the authentic voice of the brand, of the company. Who are we as a company? Um, and also to bring the, the, the authentic voice of the writer. Um, my own style of writing or my team. Uh, so it's important. Now, measuring the, 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 the quality of the content um, can be uh, using some, um, um, you know, scales and ranking. And this is something that I'm now deploying um, uh, on my website, because you know, without getting the feedback from the audience, um, you almost like blind. So you 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 think you create the best content, you know, ever, but it sh- it should meet the expectation of the of the audience. So you need to get some feedback. So this feedback can be with the with the reaction of people that consuming and reading the the content on on the on the on the blog or the website and such. But also to, re- to, to to speak with real customers and ask them, did, did, is this help you? Now, working in the B two B organization, it's easier for me to cross to to, cross, to make this cross checking because we have sellers that meet real customers, and I encourage my team members to meet those customers. And we are using assets in the in the sales process, and I get in feedback if those assets really help helpful or not. And we are getting you know the, the salespeople can be very aggressive going back. Hey, this is like sorry like a shitty whatever <laughs> uh, um, paper. And I'm going back to the beginning of our discussion. Again, my, my own personal experience working in sales, I, I, I really have like a, a, allergic uh, allergies for a marketing fluff, okay? I want the content to be very specific, hard-coded. Um, you know, uh, I call it like this type of assets is very common. Like what is the reason to believe? Give me facts. Give me figures. Re- give me statistics. Give me real examples. Um, this is more compelling. And for me, this is like a few of the uh, of the of the directions or or the ways for to, to measure the quality of the content. So just so I'm clear though, when you talk about scaling, is it a thumbs up, thumbs down on the web page? Is it a one to ten? Like do you actually have something on the content where cus- customers are ranking it? I'm optimizing now. Now thumb up, th- thumb down is nice, but it's not enough. I, okay. I would like numbers. I, I need a scale. Um, good or bad is nice, but it's not enough for me. I would like I would like to rank them now. Once I have this kind of ranking, it will be easier for me, first of all, to better understand what are the expectations of the audience of the visitors, and also it's more important to create the right content for my paid campaigns. I'm talking about organic, you know, content, but now when I'm spending dollars on that, I need to be very very precise. So do I use the right assets? And I can think about a third uh, advantage is to ensure that the content I create as a marketing manager meets the com- company strategy. For instance, if I see in a lot of uh, like, you know, on the, on the scale one to five, a lot of five of a content that is, has no, no connection to the current strategy of the company in 2024, it's great I'm getting five, but it's, there is a gap between my content and the strategy of the company. It's a bad sign. But I need to measure that. Yeah, I remember talking to a major uh, 
marketing company and and they just put out so many blog posts and some of them seemed so disconnected from their brand like you talk about their value proposition and i was sitting down with this the, one of the marketing managers or someone at one point and i was asking well, i don't understand the strategy there and they're like well we got a lot of interns we got a lot of junior marketers we got to get a certain amount of leads from the blog uh, every month and so we just write about yeah. everything and you yeah know. It's, 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 it's almost like you're working, working for the seo you know yes uh, exactly that's an and, other machine you got to be careful not know, to work for i know and by the way now it's getting harder and harder because you know the seo world is changing using gen ai it's not only search engine it's like chats uh, it's a different type of uh, seo so and we are learning that learning that by the way this uh, kind of methods uh, and we are have, have started to change the way we create content and the, the the right format for the content because things that work in the past for google search are not working for Gemini or work differently for Gemini or ChatGPT or other um, 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 chatbots. So we need to adjust uh, our the type of content and the structure of the content in order to meet the new algorithm. Can you think of any specific examples? Are you talking about FAQ, short form versus long form snippets? Like what? What is there a specific thing you're doing differently for AI? Yeah, we found out, for instance, that those tools really love uh, like a structure uh, formats. Uh, like tables, uh, you don't have to show the you know the the borders of the tables, but once the 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 output the content is is built in the, in the format of the table, it's easier for those tools to uh, um, capture the the data. So we have started to work with some consultant in order to change the way we create content because now still okay Google search Bing whatever they are still dominate the world, but within one year two years. All the practices that we are doing in SEO for the last 20 years are, you know, are going to the trash. We need to adjust ourselves to a new type of uh, methods. Yeah, it's interesting. And I would suggest to look at your analytics because when I'm looking at our refers, you know, it's the traditional, you know, Google's whatever, but you're starting to see like ChatGPT and some of the AI engines we get in there too. Um, so you mentioned one last lesson here. Networking is a talent and a skill. How did you learn this lesson? Uh, to be honest, I learned that from my mother. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, she she is a very social person, so uh, I learned from her as as the, as the as a boy. But from a, from a business perspective, I think the 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 first uh, the first time I learned the power of uh, being a great 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 networker worker was uh, one of the the first uh, uh, my first day as a as a salesperson. <laughs> I joined uh, one of the season the sales. Uh, sales account executive uh, in a big uh, conference and it was like a big customer event and she had uh, uh, been with the company for a few years she was like senior than me very experienced and throughout the event I noticed that both existing and potential clients approach her engage in conversation with her and vice versa she was like simply a, a magnet so people reach to her come to her she make this kind of connection between people and capture some opportunities and leads. Uh, it was almost for me, it was like overwhelming. It was like a pure magic to see how the personality of the person popped out in those interactions with real people and how you can translate those interactions into business. So for me, networking or being a networker is an asset. And I can tell you that I'm allocating a certain amount of my time every week to meet with people. Um, yeah, I'm trying to uh, secure this time. For me, it's uh, like a very precious time to spend with with real people, um, um, and and converse with them and learn with them. And 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 the network, the power. We we talked about you know the differences between AI and people and human beings. This is one of the differences. Uh, people uh, prefer to connect with other people. This is how evolution made us human beings. And why not to make the most of it? <laughs> So I agree. The struggle I've always had is I'm a super introverted guy, right? So I've always struggled with this. Uh, so let me ask you, I think you're a pretty good networker on LinkedIn, right? So do you have any specific tips or tactics or what works, what doesn't when it comes to LinkedIn networking? I got to admit, like I said, I'm introverted. I'm less of a reach out type of person, unless there's something real specific. It's someone I used to work with. I see them mentioned in the Wall Street Journal or something like that. Or, you know, there's some real specific thing yeah. like that. But what I get mostly, honestly, is just endless uh, BDR, <laughs> SDR type of 
sales yeah. request, you know, like, oh my gosh, we got to get on a calendar and talk about whatever the thing I'm selling. Um, and, that, you know, occasionally I get those real genuine networking, but it's, it's just become such a flood of that. So do you have any specific tips of something that's worked for you there? Yeah, many tips. I can't speak about, uh, talk about LinkedIn for hours. So uh, I mean, it's just like a warning. This is like a warning. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a few tens of uh, followers and connections on LinkedIn. Uh, for me, it's uh, like a gold a gold mine. Um, but uh, over the time, I've started to look on the networking on LinkedIn in a more strategic uh, way. Um, and it started with my own objectives. Um, and, and based on my own objective, uh, I define the type of network I would like to establish. Um, and it's very important because there are, there are some few approaches, like, are you going to approach to any person? You know, are you going to accept any kind of connection request? What are the boundaries? What is your strategy? So I'm trying to be very structured in that way and accept only connection requests that meets my own objective now. And in some cases, nobody will, I hope nobody will get offended. In some cases, I deleted, you know, all connections that doesn't serve my current objective in 2024. Maybe I engage with them like 15 years ago. Um, so first of all, my, my first tip is, is think about um, on your network as a tool, okay? And you need to for this tool to be sharp and ready and serve you now, not things you did in the past, but for now and, and, and in the near future. So this is one thing. The other thing is that if you uh, identified some of uh, important people you would like to engage with, okay, and currently you are not connected, uh, in some cases, when you are sending a connection request too soon, uh, you are going to be rejected. So what my, my tip for, for anyone that would like to approach like a senior you know, executive or any kind of influencer and such, try to cook this relationship in advance, okay? Identify this person, spread some likes, Comment on post. It's super, super important. Establish your own brand as an expert. You know, create this kind of awareness to your presence. And only once you think you establish this kind of connection, send the first connection request. And it's it's happening. Most of the most of the people don't act like that. Now, going back to the what you mentioned about those SDRs or BDRs that approach that, this is really bad practice coming from sellers that don't understand that uh, the operating on LinkedIn is very similar to the real life, okay? You're walking uh, down the road. You're not approaching to any stranger, right? Someone will call the police. So don't take those practices and bring them to the virtual world. It's the same. It's people. LinkedIn is not a platform for lead generation. It's a platform for creating or establishing relationship. Um, and relationship is something that is very fragile. You need to gain trust. Without trust, you will not do sales. So if someone approached you, I, I'm telling you what I'm doing. If someone approached you just after I'm accepting a connection request and trying to pitch me, I, I block them. I delete them. Okay? For me, they're not professionals, and I don't want to waste my time. Amen, brother. Amen. Preach it. I love it. So uh, that's some great advice for LinkedIn. Well, Tomar, we talked about so many different things about what it means to be a marketer from all your different stories, from all your different lessons. If you had to break it down, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? Wow. I think, you know, uh, the marketing discipline has went through so many changes during the last 20, 25 years, you know, um, you know, the digital marketing and the mobile marketing and now using AI, a lot of practice, you know, remote working, many, many revolutions and such. I, I think what, what uh, for me, um, it's, 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 it's still valid, it's still important, um, are the, the following things. First of all, I think curiosity. Um, for, for, for a good, good marketing, you need to be very curious. You need to learn a lot. Uh, you need to, um, to care about people. In the end, it's people and it's the insights from people. It can be like uh, consumers, can be organization, like companies, businesses and such. But you need to, 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 to care about, uh, about them and uh, about their, in their interest and understand, understand their, their, their needs and motivation. So curiosity is, is number one. Uh, the second, uh, I would say, quality is, uh, 
um i would say um be bold okay uh, boldness for me is is like a virtue of a good, a good marketer uh, i think we we discussed about that if you are staying in your comfort zone you will be okay but okay is not enough um the, the market is super super competitive and in order to uh, to stand out you need to take some bold moves and it's okay to make mistakes calculate calculate it mistake you know whatever but be bold and for me being bold by the way it's not only to do those crazy creative campaigns in the super bowl whatever being bold is to to be committed to your numbers being bold is say hey i'm not measuring myself on leads i'm measuring myself on real revenue coming to the the, the company don't hide behind the behind, behind the marketing art you know Marketing is a profession, so be professional, committed to your numbers. So for me, it's like those kind, this kind of, you know, um, um, I would say balance between uh, being professional, uh, be like a people-oriented person, and uh, be bold. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all of the bold lessons from your career, Tomer. I learned a lot. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was fun. Good. I'm glad to hear that. And uh, thank you to everyone for listening. I hope you learned a lot. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com. Thank you.